Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kiana, and I'm going to be the moderator for this coffee house. So this week, we are uh, having a presentation from Alexandria Cosby. Alex is a fourth year wildlife biology and conservation student. She's from Manitoulin Island, and she found her passion for wildlife on her gap year, where she volunteered abroad in multiple different countries with wildlife rescue organizations. Currently, she's working with Dr. Travis Steffens, studying the relationship between human nutrition and lemur abundance using a One Health approach. And she's going to be giving an overview of a paper on lemur abundance and parasites in Madagascar. So, Alex, whenever you're ready, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Thanks, Kiana. I'm just going to screen share with everyone so that you can see the PowerPoint that I've got with it. So. Awesome, thanks. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Alexandria and today I'm going to be discussing the paper Climate Change, uh, Predictive Modeling and Lemur Health, Assessing Impacts of Climate Change on Health and Conservation in Madagascar by Barrett et al. 2013. So lemurs in Madagascar are at a high risk of extinction due to many anthropogenic cause disturbances such as land conversion to agriculture, hunting, and climate change, with the main threat being habitat loss. However, Climate change has been identified as a potential threat to lemurs in Madagascar, not only because of its abiotic effects on temperature and rainfall, but also because it can cause shifts in parasite ranges. Parasites, like all species, have a range of tolerance which dictates what environmental conditions they need to survive in. For example, some parasites need warm and moist conditions to reproduce and increased rainfall and humidity will expand the ranges of suitable breeding environments for these parasites. While most animals live with some degree of parasites, the expansion of novel parasites and the increased load could be detrimental to lemur health. In addition to the threat that parasite expansion poses to humans, domestic animals and other wildlife have the potential to contract and be negatively affected by these parasites. To make matters worse, as resource availability shrinks, many different species, including humans, will be forced to interact more, making the risk of transmission even higher. Using this prior knowledge about range tolerance, Barrett et al. were able to use predictive models to make predictions about how parasite ranges in Madagascar would be affected in response to climate change. Understanding how parasites a range will change will help to assess lemur health and devise strategies to protect populations. The results of this study can be used for conservation implications and to monitor, monitor zoonotic parasites and disease expansion in Madagascar. To try and answer the question of how parasite ranges would change in response to climate change, the team collected existing information about four helmets, which are parasites that live inside the body like, as tape, like tapeworms, and two ectoparasites, which live outside the body like mites. These specific parasites were chosen because of their potential for pathogenic effects and ability to be vectors for disease, as well as because they are common parasites which affect a wide range of vertebrate species in Madagascar. The majority of this data was collected from the ongoing Pro Prosimian Biomedical Survey Project, which allowed them to have a large sample as well as up-to-date literature. This information told Barrett et al. about the parasite's range of tolerance, meaning, for example, what temperature and moisture content the parasites need to live and reproduce. So that they could make their predictions relative to lemurs, the team used GIS software to quantify forest cover since the range expansion of parasites would only affect lemurs if their range overlapped with lemur habitat. These different methods allow the team to use maximum entropy distributions to create species distribution models to predict how changes in factors such as temperature, precipitation, and forest cover would affect parasite ranges. Using this predictive model, the team predicted that all parasites would experience varying degrees of a range shift. Interestingly, Lepidia mites, an ectoparasite, and Lemostrongolus, and helmet, experience a slight range reduction of 1 and 7% respectively, with all others experiencing varying range expansions. On average, helmets expanded by 22% and ectoparasites expanded by 11%. In 2013, when the paper was published, they estimated that helmets and ectoparasites existed in 67 and 74% of, respectively, of forests in Madagascar. If their future predictions are accurate, this would mean that by the year 2080, helmets and ectoparasites would exist in 79 and 81%, respectively, of forests in Madagascar. The greatest increase would be seen from Hymopelius, which experienced a range increase of 60%. These predictions were operating under future climate change estimates that the mean temperature in Madagascar would increase by 1.1 to 2.6 degrees Celsius, with the greatest warming in the already arid south. 
The team was working with the optimistic assumption that there will still be lemurs and forests in Madagascar in 2080. While most parasites don't kill their hosts as they need them to survive, the added pressure of parasites on already dwindling populations may push them closer to extinction. The added seasonal rainfall will likely create regions of high moisture content, which will establish microhabitats for parasite larvae, making the risk of environmental transmission even higher. Madagascar is an extremely impoverished country, and its citizens already heavily rely on forest products. As lemur habitat becomes restricted, human-wildlife interactions become, will become more prevalent, and the risk of parasite and disease transmission is likely to increase as well. Understanding how climate change will be affected will affect rain shifts in Madagascar or can be easily applied to other regions, especially those of high biodiversity, which typically have the highest levels of parasite and disease transmission. And I just had a couple of thoughts for you guys at the end that might be good for discussion points after that. Though I thought this paper was really well written, I felt that they missed an opportunity to make it more applicable to other fields, such as human health or agriculture, considering the foundation for both were already in the paper. Um, and then my other thought was, a lot of the time when people think of the effects of climate change, their mind goes to abiotic factors like change in temperature or rainfall. And I really enjoyed that this paper took a biocentric view and focused on biotic factors like parasite expansion, which are not often thought of as a consequence of climate change. Awesome, thank you, Alex. So if anyone has any questions, if they want to go ahead and raise their hand or put them in the chat and I can read them out loud, that would be great. Uh, Jessica, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, um, I'm just curious, we know this, uh, you said in your presentation that most uh, parasites don't actually kill the host. So what implication does it have on um, maybe reproduction or what does it necessarily do to the species that would impact its numbers in the future? Yeah, so like most animals have like a couple parasites, like it's very common for like cats and dogs to have worms like that's kind of one that we can all kind of understand and relate to and it doesn't kill them but it just kind of lowers their health overall so because their body is constantly fighting um the parasites within them that they're losing a lot of nutrition towards that that their immune system can be really lowered and with those couple parasites it's not too bad they can fight off colds but if all of a sudden the forest is kind of ridden with parasites that their immune system is going to be devoting so much energy to fighting them off that they're not going to be able to fight off normal infections or colds, not to mention the fact that parasites inside and outside, like leaving little tiny wounds in your skin or in your intestines can make you vulnerable to bacteria to get in that obviously you're not able to clean animals aren't able to clean wounds of mites once they come off and things like that. And so it just leaves them a lot more vulnerable to extra diseases and can really hurt their populations if all of a sudden that couple of worms they had is now 400 worms and none of the nutrition they're getting into their body is actually going to them. Yeah, so that's pretty interesting. So it's more of, um, I guess, like an indirect cause of death, um, if it does cause death. Yeah, often be. I'm not sure about the reproductive. That's a really good point, though. I would definitely assume because a lot of the time when animals um, like animals are really smart and very in tune with their body that a lot of times when they don't feel that they could feasibly raise a baby right now that the reproductive system will likely shut down just like in humans when if we have nutritional deficits that your reproductive system understands that you can barely keep yourself alive let alone another being so that's a, that's a really good point and I definitely agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, Marilyn's question is, what sort of strategies are being used to combat these problems? Um, I'm not sure, should you clarify like, do you mean parasite expansion or climate change overall? Parasite expansion. Um, Madagascar is a super interesting place to study just because it's so unlike anywhere you've ever heard of for the fact that there's so many endemic species and then also the fact that Madagascar is horribly impoverished like 90 percent of the population lives on less than like a couple dollars a day and so honestly not a lot is being done that is kind of as horrible as it sounds kind of bigger fish to fry from what i've understood reading other papers that the fact that forests are disappearing at an alarming rate is kind of more of a 
for first priority rather than parasite expansion, because really there's very little you can do about parasite expansion. You can vaccinate your animals and make sure that you limit contact with wildlife. But at the end of the day, you can't afford to feed yourself, let alone take your dog to the vet. And you heavily rely on forest products because agriculture is just diminishing and they don't have great techniques. And so really very little can be done or is being done right now. Thank you. Uh, Sydney, would you like to go ahead? Um, you mentioned that you thought they missed an area of including human health better in this article. Can you expand a bit on what you mean by that? Is it um, the interactions between the human animal environmental health or specifically how these the parasite expansion will impact human health directly? published in 2013, One One Health was definitely already established, but it wasn't nearly as big as it is today. And the paper mentioned a couple times that obviously human interactions are going to dictate if, like how, or going to have a big impact on the transmission and the fact that like, like humans are interacting with animals more and that you're kind of in close range because it's just a natural thing that like you want to live near rivers and forests and that's the lemur habitat. They mentioned a couple of times with like domestic animals and livestock too, just referencing a couple studies. And I understand they try to keep their paper very like wildlife centric, but I just feel like they missed a little bit of an opportunity to make it one, one health approach that they focus mostly on lemurs and they mentioned humans and domestic animals a little bit, but it just kind of seemed like they missed the mark because parasites obviously are gonna affect all of them. Like the, the ones they studied are very, very common like tapeworms that, yeah, if humans drink contaminated water could easily get that. But it's kind of like because they took their paper from a wildlife, a wildlife view, they didn't focus on that, which is fine. I just, I don't know, learning more about One Health and knowing how big it is and how many different prongs you can kind of get in with there, I think they could have done a little bit better with that. Right, right. I totally agree. And um, because of the lens that they took, it's, it's very important information to have and perhaps using this going forward, someone looking for One Health information can use these predictive models to start connecting back to other predictors of health in both animal and human populations and environment. Thank you, Alexandria. Yeah, this, this paper would be a great stepping stone because they've already done the grunt work in looking into these parasites and the predictive models, that it'd be really, really easy to then apply it to human or domestic animals or livestock. But obviously you can't do everything in one paper. But. Of course. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, Jessica, I'm not sure if your hand is still raised from before or you have another question. Yeah, um, I re-raised it. Um, so Zan Alexandria, I was wondering, um, obviously the number one issue uh, for habitat or for um, species decline, um, uh, decrease in biodiversity is from uh, loss of habitat. But at the same time, it seems uh, with development in um, developing countries, uh, human expansion, that it seems like expanding the land that humans are going to take up is kind of inevitable. So I was wondering if you had any ideas about what should be done, um, may perhaps maybe blocking off, uh, making like kind of kind of like how we have the green belt to not build buildings on for, for uh, farming and things like that to preserve um, the environment. Do you have any ideas of what we could do for animals to preserve their environments, such as like conservation areas? Um, I think that's a really good question. In Madagascar, it's really hard to start with just the fact that they don't have a very, this is all coming from my opinion of the Canadian, a very well-structured government that a lot of times their laws aren't enforced very well because like crime is already a big thing, you know, we have to prioritize, you know, making sure people don't murder each other, but making sure people don't murder in protected species obviously falls on the back burner. Um, I think a really big thing is going to be to be able to protect environments in Madagascar is that you have to work with the people. Because I can walk in there and say, I've decided it's going to be a protected area, all of it, no one can use anything. But once I leave, unless the people understand and are on board, they're just going to go back to slash and burn and killing lemurs for meat. Um, so it's definitely going to have to be a little bit of a compromise that a lot of studies have showed that even like even like limited 
resource extraction protected areas still show increased species biodiversity over a certain amount of time. And so I think it's just going to have to be saying that explaining to them and trying to make them understand that if you leave a little bit of like you don't completely harvest everything that you leave some that it's going to regrow in a couple of years and then you can have another reharvest but if you just completely take everything then it's gone forever and it's, it's just trying to get people who don't quite understand conservation to understand that kind of idea which is a pretty basic one it's just the outreach and actually the education there that'll be the issue yeah, I see. So it's kind of hard it, to educate the people when um, their public health systems and just their government systems, education systems probably aren't set up to properly deliver those kind of messages in the first place because it's kind of survival of the fittest in the, already, you know? Yeah, it, it's a really hard time to go in and say, what are you talking about? This lemur is super endangered. If you kill it, its population could die when they're saying, but if I don't, my family could die. Like, there's a crazy amount of like malnutrition there. I think 70% of the citizens don't eat like the recommended daily calories a day. And like 50% of all deaths, like childhood deaths under the age of five are related to like starving. Like food security is a giant issue there. And I think even before we can begin to tackle conservation, we need to tackle food security, which is a, you know, another problem for another day, but it's definitely the most prevalent one. Yeah, so it seems like a like a huge. I didn't know any of this about Madagascar. I should uh, read up a bit more about that. But um, it seems like a a massive humanitarian issue. Uh, maybe more a more developed country would need to step in to get them on that right path, um, so that these things could eventually be implemented. But it's kind of you're right. It's like we're in Canada with healthcare and lots of food, and we're like, oh, the lemurs. Oh no, the lemurs and. <laughs> They're worried about their next meal, right? So just a matter of priorities for sure. Yeah, it's definitely going to take a lot of on the ground work rather than just kind of saying from Canada, you should do this or even sending money because just sending money unless the foundation is laid and it, it's, it's not going to do a lot. So that money is going to go towards the meals for the next week, but it could better go towards like developing better agricultural practices so that you get a better yield. And so there's more long term solutions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sydney, would you like to go ahead again? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you guys raised a lot of really important points there that we have so much focus on, yes, protecting the lemurs because we have the privilege of looking at the situation from an area, well, at least most sense is secure, and we have, we have that ability. But I know that, so you're working with Travis, and I know that he has some, I don't education system or way of going in and understanding the area's priorities and um, culture. And I was wondering if you can elaborate on what you and your lab are doing to encourage that more holistic education and understanding and making sure that the people and the stakeholders that are actually living in areas are taking an important role in how that education is formed. Yeah, for sure. So um, right now I'm actually using a little bit of Travis's old data and we're trying to find a connection between human nutrition and lemur abundance. Um, just because rather than going at lemur conservation from a lemur conservation angle, it's going to be a lot easier to go at it from uh, saving the people angle. And so we're trying to see if areas that have better human nutrition have more brown lemurs. And brown lemurs are one of the biggest species in Madagascar, and they're really important seed dispersers. So like, they're, it's crazy. Like thinking about Madagascar, it's such like a weird mind trip of a place for the fact that like a four kilogram lemur is the biggest animal, but it really is. And so having those giant, like those big animals that can eat not only the little fruit, but also the big fruit and do this important seed dispersal and be an important species in the ecosystem is huge. And so we're trying to find a connection that if you have better nutrition, then you're likely more food secure. And so you're not going into the forest and chopping down trees and starting fires and hunting lemurs. And so if you have better nutrition, there's going to be more lemurs. And so then we're trying to show that there's going to be a feedback loop that if you have more lemurs, there's going to be more reforesting, better biodiversity, a healthier ecosystem, which is in then in turn, because of a healthy environment, is going to create better human nutrition. So we're trying to show that there's kind of a loop between the two so that we can endorse like, all right, well, if you get more food secure, there'll be more lemurs, but lemurs benefit you. They're not just 
these crazy guys that go and rummage through your garbage, they're actually someone that's contributing to the ecosystem and helping humans in the long run. And so we're kind of looking at that cycle right now. Well, at least I, that's what I'm looking at. But. That's great to hear. So really sending home the message that improving health in one area can improve for all and making sure that the people are being heard and their needs are met. That's great. So, thank you. And if I could just jump in really quick as well, I'm also working with uh, Dr. Steffens alongside Alex, and I kind of echo what she's been saying that it's really interesting to uh, learn about Madagascar because it's something that I didn't know a lot about. And like Alex said, it's so it's so um, interesting and complicated, and it's such a unique place. And it's really it's really fascinating to see how Alex's perspective is a bit different than mine because she's a wildlife biology student and so she brings a lot of knowledge about um, not necessarily lemurs but just ecosystems and animals whereas I'm more focused on nutrition and so originally I thought we would have nothing in common but as we both dug into the literature I think we realized more and more that what we were looking at was kind of the same even if we approached it from slightly different angles so I don't know if you would agree with that, Alex, but originally I thought that maybe we wouldn't have any connections in our work, but I found it's overlapped a lot. I definitely agree. Taking the one health approach with it has made it so similar that like you're mostly nutrition, whereas I'm wildlife. But as we dug into it more that it's one health, the, like the health of everything is super connected. So it's been really interesting working with you like from that different perspective, because yeah, I, I do everything with wildlife coming first in mind. Uh, Jessica, is your hand, is that your hand raised a second time? Yes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add, I really like that perspective. It's kind of like if somebody tried to convince me that the raccoons in my garbage were actually essential for the biodiversity of my community, I wouldn't believe it. But um, that's a very interesting point that you have to change the perspective of the um, of the uh, people who inhabit Madagascar in order to um, benefit everybody. Yeah, it, it's been really interesting, too. And then, like, I didn't even think of the cultural side. Like, the cultural side is huge, too, because, you like, we don't understand their culture. We're not from there. We weren't raised on it. It's not our values. But I kind of, like, I, I kind of make it similar to, like, in Canada with Indigenous people that if you were just going to say, you know what, we've decided we're going to protect white-tailed deer. No one's allowed to hunt them ever again you're completely disregarding an entire group of people and their way of life and culture that they're like, whoa, 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 never have we ever went and wiped out an entire population because we overhunt. We use substance agriculture or substance hunting and, you know, or substance subsistence hunting and it's our way of life and our culture. And you're just kind of shoving that aside. And, and so that's been an interesting thing too, that you, like you don't like health and nutrition aside, you're being horribly disrespectful to your, their culture if you come in and say, yep, no, we decided no more hunting, you're going to do things Western, and that's it. So that, that's also another horribly complicated prong approach to it. Yeah, that's super interesting that there would be like a, a cultural a cultural aspect to all of this. Um, another like little talking point, it's not, it's not off topic, but um, I watched this video earlier today and it basically mentioned that um, a decrease in biodiversity is an issue because say um, a disease like West Nile that spreads from birds um, and then goes to mosquitoes and then spreads to humans that kills like I think 150 Americans on average each year. Um, when you decrease the biodiversity, you actually increase the number of species that are more resilient against those um, pathogens. Uh, it could be a parasite, it could be a virus, which actually increases the level of transmission because um, there's more of a direct route to get um, two different species. So I was wondering if um, you found in your research maybe a decrease in certain lemur populations um, is like projected to have an impact on uh, um, parasite transmission um, between whether it's humans or between lemurs? Um, I think my like at the end of the paper I think it actually said something similar to the opposite that like high levels of biodiversity actually have higher um, like parasite transmission but I don't know if that's just 
like is like specific to Madagascar. So I'm not 100% sure. What you're saying definitely makes sense, but I'm not sure. Does anyone else have a comment? If if you guys think you know better. Hi, yeah, I'm actually from Texas, just to let y'all know. <laughs> um, but uh, I know that with uh, biodiversity, um, like uh, we saw an increase in Lyme disease when um, the the habitats where the, the forests were being um, like due to de deforestation, there's there's definitely a um, increase of uh, Lyme disease when um, I think it's the black footed mouse. I think um, when the ticks started going from them and then onto to humans, uh, to deer and humans. So. So was that the, the decrease in biodiversity that increased Lyme disease? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, so maybe um, some conflicting views on that one. It might be it might be region specific. Madagascar might be a different case because it's just uh, one little island like that. I'm not sure. I think Kimberly's case is very similar to what the paper was talking about overall, just in that deforestation is pushing like mice could have normally like happily lived in the forest, but because they lost their habitat, they got pushed further into human society where obviously contact is going to be a lot higher that, that things get into the water, things touch each other's food. And so I think like that, that's pretty parallel. Yeah, so per, perhaps in, in the scenario that I was um, reading up on, that's probably because when you deforest, I think mice have an easier time um, going into human habitats and so do lemurs versus birds, um, which would, I think, be more vulnerable in that case if they're typically, uh, when they typically live in the forest. I think that's probably, yeah, that's probably the transition that decreased biodiversity is associated with deforestation, but deforestation is associated with those couple, those like few species that are able to amalgamate into human society, like raccoons and rats that they'll be vectors for disease and that like they live completely fine with all these parasites but we're not used to it and we have little wussy immune systems that it really hurts us yeah we're pretty weak eh? <laughs> yeah there's, there's actually been like really i can't think of the name of it overall but there's been really interesting papers that talk about do we have so many autoimmune deficiencies because we have so few parasites and that like parasites are almost kind of like when you let your kids eat a little bit of dirt and it builds up their immune system but because we don't have those couple parasites that keep our immune system on our toes that when we do get hit with something big it just completely knocks us out and our immune system starts attacking itself because it's just like oh my gosh yeah i've even found um a few of my friends who were uh self-quarantining like like very very hard for months on end um, like delivering groceries, everything. The second that they left their homes for any reason, they got violently ill. And I think that goes to show that our immune systems already aren't the best. And if you further take out pathogens and parasites and viral agents out of your environment, then we kind of turn into mushy blobs that'll absorb anything and get sick. <laughs> All right, um, I just wanted to jump in and say that it's past 1 p.m. So we are running out of time. Um, if anyone has one more question and they'd like to raise their hand, we can take um, a couple more. So does anyone have one final question or comment around this conversation of parasites? Mm -hmm. Alex, is there anything you want to say to um, round it out? Oh, and Jessica? Oh yeah, just just really oh sorry. Yeah, just really quick. Um I just wanted to hear like what your favorite part of the research has been so far. Um like what you enjoyed the most or the the best thing that you've like taken from the experience. Um yeah, so the, the experience has been super crazy and interesting just to the fact that we were supposed to actually be in Madagascar for this. And so we've kind of done the flip side of doing a bunch of prior research before before we even had this on the ground. But I really enjoyed just looking at it from the, these different angles. That One Health has been a really interesting thing because in my degree, everything's always, you know, animal focused. Like, how are we going to fix these animals? How are we going to save them? But taking a step back and realizing that it's a, it's a big thing that you have to address people's issues and like the societal issues and like also taking into account their culture in order to actually make long-term lasting effects has been really interesting because I've never even thought of anthropology as an option, but I think I'll likely even do my master's in public issues anthropology 
and focus on primatology with that one health approach so that I can do all these great conservation things, but actually have it mean something that's going to be lasting and not only help animals, but help people too. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. I'm so glad you've had a great experience. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for participating. And next week's coffee house is actually me. Um, so I will be talking about something somewhat similar, um, also about lemurs, also about Madagascar. So if you're interested in following up with a slightly uh, different angle to this, then um, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much. Great job, Alexandria.